So today we are going to talk about the motor functions of basal ganglia. It means there are some other functions which are other than the motor, right? Even though average students only talk about the motor functions. Motor functions of basal ganglia. Actually, this is misnomer, right? It should not be called ganglia because by definition, ganglion is collection of cell bodies, neuronal cell bodies outside the central nervous system. But of course, basal ganglia are present within central nervous system. So now they are called basal nuclei. How do you define nuclei? How do you define nuclei? Oh, you are going to. Uh, she says that nuclei are collections of cell bodies in central nervous system surrounded by the white matter because cortex is also collections of cell body. Is that right? So basal ganglia are actually basal nuclei, right? Why we don't call them ganglia? Because ganglia are by definition collections of cell bodies of neurons outside the central nervous system. But as basal ganglia are present within the central nervous system, so the name is now replaced by basal nuclei, right? Now exactly what they are, right? These are the masses of gray matter at the base of cerebral hemisphere, right? These are masses of gray matter at the base of cerebral hemisphere spheres right so let me draw a diagram and show you how where exactly they are present right let's pose here cerebral hemisphere okay let me make it midbrain of course pond and medulla spinal cord now you must be knowing that here are first of all just above the midbrain what are these two structures which are bilateral present adjacent to each other yes these are thalami right these are thalamus and just lateral to the thalamus lateral to the thalamus the masses of gray matter here on bilaterally on both sides right these are two thalami on the sides of that there are two more masses of gray matter and in between them of course what is here this is white matter right this bundle of white matter is called internal capsule that's good Now, there are thalami, okay, let's make a little kitchen here, just remember, these are two eggs, thalami are like eggs, and on this side, these are two pieces of cheese, right, there's a little kitchen here, these are two eggs, and on the side, what are these, these are two cheese pieces, is that right, okay, now, I will bring this kitchen out, because I have to draw some other important things. You always understand that whenever there is kitchen, at night there are rats also. So there will be some rats also here. Let's say that here I put this uh, egg which is thalami, right? And on the side these are cheese pieces, right? And of course all of them are grey matter, right? Now, on the thalamus, on the egg, special type of rat is sitting there there is a rat sitting over here right and here is the head of the rat right this is the head of the rat here is the body of the rat and here is going to be the tail of the rat Now, what is this? That this, this is a C-shaped mass of gray matter or because it is embedded within deep in central nervous system, C-shaped nucleus, right? 
and this is present bilaterally. When we say this is present bilaterally, now this green colored structure, this is called not red, what we call it? Yes, quadrate nucleus. What is it? Quadrate nucleus. So, this is our quadrate nucleus. Right? Am I clear? Now we can imagine like this. If one of you can come here, I will have to take an example. Okay, but you are so tall, you will make me look even shorter. But anyway, this is life, you know. Wow, you, he is coming in camera or not? He is in camera, okay. Just make it like this. Look, yeah, in front of them. So what is this? These are two thalami. Is that right? And what are these? On the side, these were two eggs and these are two cheese pieces. This cheese piece and this cheese piece is basically masses of gray matter. This mass of gray matter and this mass of gray matter which is cheese piece, this is basically called lentiform nucleus. So there are thalami on the sides we have, what are these? Lentiform nuclei. And then what is happening? Rat is sitting on the thalamus. Here interior part of the rat, head of the rat going like this over the thalamus, behind the thalamus and then tail is coming under it. So what happened? Rat is sitting in this arrangement and here also it is sitting like that arrangement. Now this rat structure is basically quadrate nucleus. So what structure we are arranging here? Thalami. On the side of the thalami there are lentiform nuclei, right? On the thalami there is quadrate nucleus. If you follow it interiorly it will move forward and laterally and head of the quadrate will be trying to approach. Yes, cheese. Rat love to lick the cheese. So, right, head of the caudate, then body of the caudate over it, and then tail of the caudate going from here. Is that right? Thank you. Now, in this diagram, when we see structure like this, is that right? Now, in between these structures, there is a gap here. And there is a gap here. Is that right? What is present in this gap? Yes, you don't know it. You must be knowing Scott. Internal capsule. Internal capsule. What about you? It's very easy to understand. Here is cheese, here is egg, here is the rat, and here is some. Yes. What is this? Salad. Salad pieces here. And this salad pieces, this blue structure is basically bundle of axons, of course white matter, right? What are these? These are bundles of axons which are passing through this gap. They are descending cortico cortical fibers are going down and there are other fibers which are going up. So what is really there? What we really see? That the masses of gray matter having a C-shaped gap and through this gap white matter is going up and down. This compressed white matter in this gap, this is called internal capsule. Now the question is that why it is called internal capsule? Why it is called internal capsule? Because there must be something in external capsule also. Actually, there is some white matter which is also present over here. Right? Here and here. So, when initially, when neurologists made section in this area, what did they see? I will draw it here now. They saw that here is thalamus. Thalamus. Right? They found there was another mass of gray matter. Which, were, which we will calling, we were calling lentiform nucleus and when they were making a section head of the coordinate was somewhere, yes, here and here. This was the rat, you know, it's cut section of the rat, it's weeping now. Is that right? Now, actually, when they made a section here, 
white matter which was going up and down that was pressed between these structures is that right so white matter was going up and down in between these masses of gray matter is that right and this was this white matter was having another white matter outside this structure right now this was looking like a lens so they called lentiform nucleus this piece of cheese was lentiform nucleus and this gray lentiform nucleus was apparently surrounded by white matter inside as well as outside so they called it that this lentiform nucleus is in a white capsule this was considered internal capsule and this was considered external capsule is that right so what is internal capsule internal capsule is just collection of lot of axons bundle going up and down right between the thalamus and lentiform nucleus posteriorly and anteriorly between the caudate head and lentiform nucleus is that right but there is external capsule also which is laterally to the what is the structure lateral to the lentiform nucleus then any question up to this is it clear now if you go more laterally they found a little thin piece of gray matter here right what is this piece of gray matter called let's start from the center what was this this was thalami is that right laterally you move what is this here internal capsule more laterally you move there is a lentiform nucleus is that right more laterally you move what is it external capsule more laterally you move what is it clostrum the structure is called clostrum and then there is another thin capsule here thin white matter right and this is called of course if this is internal capsule this is internal capsule this is external capsule right what should be this one now extreme capsule very good this is called extreme capsule is that right these, these basic structure at the base of the brain are clear there is no problem with this is that right now I will draw these structures here we go back to our original diagram which we, were, we started our lecture with it that they were thalami and they were internal capsule laterally to that they were lentiform nucleus and then what is here yes please external capsule and what is here very thin gray matter yes clostrum and again what is here extreme capsule is the right and if you go to the top okay now what really happens from here this is of course what is this lobe in the section parietal and this is temporal lobe uh, deep into this there is a gray matter here right and here also what is this gray matter called yes please these are the structures that appear in many sections so you should have a very clear concept what is this gray matter deeply buried insula very good insula right so this is insula any question up to this and now I can make here your rack that is sitting what is this caudate nucleus its body is over this then we are repeating it here and from here yes tail of the caudate and here it is yes head of the caudate and some of its gray matter is approaching through the most interior part of internal capsule to the what is this lentiform nucleus same is on this side Oh, you are looking for putaman. Yes, we have to ask this rat where is the putaman because this rat loves the putaman. Yes, that's very important. Again, I will go to putaman. Again, now you will identify structures up to now. What is this? Thalamus, right? 
what is this internal capsule what are these structures together lentiform nucleus this outermost part of the lentiform nucleus this is called putamen you know rat love to lick the putamen you look here from anterior side so this is putamen and more medial to that there is globus pallidus there is globus pallidus so we can say lentiform nucleus consists of putamen laterally and globus pallidus medially is that okay any problem up to this and now of course these are your beautiful what are these thalami and i want to make some structure here under the thalami yes who will tell me what are these structures please tell me something under the thalami must be subthalamus what is it sub thalamus and of course you must be knowing that here should be what is what structure should be here please tell me mid brain right so there have to be mid brain here and if i draw a section of mid brain here right this is section of the mid brain and here is cerebral liquid duct of course you know there are superior colliculi here superior colliculi here the most important structure which i'm interested to draw here is yes what is that what are these structures substantia nigra and in substantia nigra its posterior part is very dark colored and very dense very dense uh, gray matter so we call it substantia nigra pars compacta right and anterior part of the substantia nigra is less densely packed gray matter so this interior part is called yes please very good substantia nigra pars yes pars reticularis reticularis and here it is substantia nigra yes pars compacta right now these are some structures which i have drawn here another thing you know this rat caudate nucleus its tail is going under the what is the structure under the cheese right and the end of this tail if i bring this rat out its tail has a special bell here a mass of gray matter special mass of gray matter which should be under this structure here right and here also tail goes under it and there is a some mass special mass of gray matter here you can just imagine this is a rat rats are planning to have a bell with the cat but right now they are having on their tail so these bells are called this masses of gray matter are called yes please amygdala. amygdala very good so this is amygdaloid body or amygdala amygdala this thing is that right so i have drawn some gray matters here but i now want to tell you exactly which components are considered to be basal ganglia and which are not part of the basal ganglia right but remember whenever in this lecture i speak basal ganglia it should be considered basal nuclei right so now after you have understood all structures here let me go into some classification and grouping of different gray matters here now basal ganglia are basically classified or group in two ways there is traditional grouping of classification or component and there is clinical clinical grouping or classification of 
basal ganglia. Now, when we talk about that traditional uh, classification of basal ganglia, it includes which structures? I will just draw rapidly. Now, you have to tell me what I'm drawing. What is it? Yes. What is this? Lentiform nucleus. This is putamen. This is putamen. This is globus pylidus. Globus pylidus. Is it right? Then yes. More laterally, there was a gray matter here. What was this? Yes. Clostrum. Very good. And there was another piece of gray matter here. You remember your friend? What was this? Quadrate. Right? And then what was this? Yes. Amygdaloid body. Now these structures are considered traditionally basal ganglia. Traditionally we think that quadrate nucleus, lentiform nucleus which consists of putamen and globus pylidus and with that amygdaloid body and claustrum. These are the structures which are considered traditionally basal ganglia. Is that right? But now most of the neurologists are following clinical concept. Clinically, what are the structures which are considered basal ganglia? I will repeat it now. Of course, lentiform nucleus is included. Putamen with globus, pylidus, right? Uh, here, if we cut, what was this structure? Quadrate. You know, it was going like this and like that, right? And with these structures, functionally, there are related these two nuclei. What is this? Subthalami and what are these? Substantia nigra. So subthalami here. Right? And then what is here? Substantia. Yes. Nigra. Actually, clinically, these are the structures which are considered basal ganglia right quadrate with lentiform nucleus and what are these subthalami and what are these structures substantia nigra now why we have put these structures with this clinically because there are special connections between the lentiform nucleus and subthalamus and lentiform nucleus and substantia nigra because functionally they make a one unit and there are very important connections in between them. So now the modern concept is that these structures should be considered basal ganglia and associated nuclei. And claustrum and amygdaloid body, they will be, now this, they are studied separately. Especially amygdaloid body is studied with the limbic system. Is that right? Which is concerned with emotions and memory and some other things. Is that right? So clinically, what are the basal ganglia? Lentiform nucleus, corded nucleus, and these two basic structure. Now, another thing. There are few more terms in which we should be very clear. Now, now onward, I will draw only left side of the structures, right? Uh, already, you know this is putamen, and you know this is globus pylidus. Globus pylidus is again divided into two parts. This is external part which is laterally and this is internal part which is yes medially is that right so globus pylidus as I can put it here that it has medial most part and lateral part right medial and lateral division right this is globus pylidus lateral or globus pylidus external and this is globus pylidus internal. Why I am stressing this because connections and functions of these two are different. Within few minutes we will see. Is that right? Now, I will draw not the whole chordate. Now onward, it is just a section of its head here. So this is your rat head. What is the head? Chordate. Is that right? Now, 
out of these structures which structure is called corpus striatum uh, which structure is called corpus striatum because we have to get some terms now clear uh, you think okay let me tell you all of them are corpus striatum before you tell me new things all of them are corpus striatum let's put it in this way for classification purpose that we put it here quadrate right what is this here lentiform nucleus has one component putamen which is and here it is globus pallidus actually all these structures together are called yes all three structures or all three structures they are called corpus striatum corpus striatum right but there is one there is another term which is called just striatum or neostriatum that terms include quadrate with putamen quadrate right with putamen these two structures together they are called neo striatum neo striatum is that right and this structure is called globus pallidus or paleo striatum or globus pallidus now again coordinate with putamen why they are grouped together as neo striatum and now onward in the lecture when i say only striatum it means i'm collectively talking about coordinate and putamen but if i mention corpus striatum then i'm including all three things is that right so why these are put together uh, coordinate nucleus and putamen because they have similar connections they have similar type of neurotransmitters right structurally and functionally not only both of them are similar even embryologically they are derived in the similar way right even though putamen structurally is well connected with globus pallidus but functionally it is it should be grouped with what is this quadrate so quadrate nucleus with the putamen they are called neo striatum so this is our what is this neo striatum now as i told you in the beginning putamen with what is this globus pallidus together in the sections it look like a lens right surrounded by internal and external capsule so both of them together are also called lentiform nucleus so what are the components of lentiform nucleus lentiform nucleus include yes putamen with globus pallidus lentiform nucleus is that right now i will ask you if i say what are the components of lentiform nucleus yes putamen with globus pallidus if i say what is neo striatum that is coordinate with putamen and if i say what is corpus striatum that include coordinate putamen and globus pallidus or corpus striatum is coordinate with lentiform nucleus am i clear do you have any question here there's no now onward we'll follow the clinical classification right that now onward in our discussion basal ganglia means mainly yes quadrate nucleus putamen with globus pallidus and what else special connections with substantia nigra and subthalamic nucleus any question here no after discussing all this thing now let's come to the how these structures function this is the real important part of the lecture the what are the important connections of basal ganglia and what are the neurotransmitters involved and how the basal ganglia function right that's what we are going to discuss now again i'm going to draw the structure of left cerebral hemi sphere now onward let's suppose here is cerebral cortex this is cerebral cortex here is your friend yeah the piece of cheese you remember 
what is this putamen this is globus pallidus yes this is putamen this is globus pallidus external globus pallidus external or lateral globus pallidus internum or medial right uh ha yes here is a structure what is this sub thalamus and here is a structures what is this substantia nigra any question up to this any question up to this there is no question and of course here is what is this structure thalami this is the midline right now before really i make this circuit right i will put this structure in structure uh, st uh, it's these connections in a bigger perspective that why we need to learn it actually the basic rule is in central nervous system about the motor system of course this is midbrain and pons and medulla and if you go down what is this spinal cord right now how really things go over basic rule is all of you know that these are the cortico spinal fibers which will come down and control the motor outflow let's suppose there are neurons here going to this muscle and there are neurons here they are going to also another group of muscle now these are lower motor neurons right lower motor neurons come out of the spinal cord as well as they come out of the what is this brain stem brain stem has also uh, lower motor neurons coming out for the muscles of head and neck lower motor neurons are the neurons having their cell bodies in spinal cord and brain stem and these fibers come out and do motor innervation at neuromuscular junctions with the muscles right is that clear now all of you are knowing that fiber which come from here right of course they will cross into medulla here to opposite side and eventually supply here and these fibers from other side also come over here and cross and then supply what are these fibers cortico spinal is that right now if we work back the basic concept of most of the student is that cortico spinal fiber start from this motor cortex and they go down and control the lower motor neuron because cortico spinal fibers are part of upper motor neurons so upper motor neurons are coming down controlling the lower motor neuron and doing the motor activity is that right now actually before these uh, there are cortico spinal fiber as well as the cortico nuclear fiber cortico nuclear fibers are these fibers right which are going to the what is this these are cortico nuclear fibers are coming from the motor cortex and sensory cortex to the motor nuclei of the brain stem is that right functionally cortico spinal fibers and cortico nuclear fibers are one and the same thing cortico spinal fibers are coming to the lower motor neurons which are cell bodies in the spinal cord and cortico nuclear fibers are those fibers which are coming from cerebral cortex to those motor neurons which are present in the brain stem or the cranial nerves clear now actually upper motor neurons fire lower motor neuron lower motor neuron fire the muscles and movement occur but actually the real idea of the movement and planning of the movement that is done at higher level and this information how to plan a movement and what are the motor plans they are actually stored in basal ganglia and cerebellum now listen very carefully that motor plans are basically stored in basal ganglia and cerebellum right for example if you want to make a movement i have to take cup of tea so look here suppose here the cup of tea just imagine and if my hand is here i will take it here this is one movement and i will bring it to my lips right take a sip and then put it there now this is not one movement multiple movements have been done so first the idea came 
is that right now to bring the cup of tea to my lips and then taking it back it is already programmed in my central nervous system is that right now those programs are where in basal ganglia and cerebellum it means these upper motor neuron activity right this should be in close association with basal ganglia and cerebral information cerebellum will study sometimes else today we are talking about basal ganglia so what i want to stress that these fibers which are coming down right when idea of the movement start this idea should not go directly from here to here first it should consult the basal ganglia basal ganglia will plan the movement right initiate the movement and then eventually once cerebral cortex consult the programs of the basal ganglia and then basal ganglia should give information back to the cerebral cortex then information should come down it means there should be some loop if this is post basal ganglia right this is basal ganglia something should happen that when movement plan start information should come here and then it should go yes through the thalamus it should go back and influence in the same way plan of the movement should come here and then it should go back so this is a very important concept that basal ganglia have electrical activity even before you start the movement you just think of a movement if you just plan that you are going to do something basal ganglia start firing even before the movement really start am i clear so this is very important concept that idea of movement when you intend to do a movement right consultation should be made with basal ganglia and then basal ganglia through the thalamus through the thalamus should fire back and then final orders are given to the corticospinal and corticonuclear fibers any question up to this right now let's see how cerebral cortex consult with the basal ganglia when it intends to initiate a movement right when it want to start a movement i will put lateral aspect of this also so it becomes more clear that what we are going to do and what is the importance of connections and functions of basal ganglia i'm making the lateral side of cerebral central nervous system right so this is pre this is central sulcus what is this pre central post central right and of course you know all those things now the important point which i want to tell you this is primary motor area is that right and what is this primary somatosensory area motor fibers which come down they come from primary motor area as well as from primary sensory area many students don't uh, understand why they come from sensory area but actually cortical spinal fibers and cortical nuclear fibers which come down they come from primary motor area as well as from primary somatosensory area plus they also come from premotor area this is pre motor area and also come from this structure and on the medial side supplementary motor area so what are the motor cortex motor cortex consists of premotor area supplementary motor area primary motor area and it is functionally also associated with somatosensory primary area now what really happens when you think of a movement movement is originally idea of the movement come from the this area what is this area prefrontal cortex this is the cortex which thinks right for example if you are planning to throw a flying kiss to someone right so first you have to think you don't throw to everyone isn't it but sometimes you plan to throw it but you don't throw it means the idea was here but it was not executed but if you are really trying to going to do flying kiss for someone first you will think the idea then things should go yes idea should go to the premotor area and supplementary motor area now look here here is basal ganglia the group right then what should happen this should consult basal ganglia right about the motor program what motor program should go should it be a more romantic or less romantic gesture right then from here through the thalamus 
this information will go back here and from here then fibers will come down and then your hand will move. So what I'm saying, at one side is the idea of the movement, in the beginning, in the end there is muscle, is that right? There is premotor cord, what is this? Idea start from the prefrontal cortex, it will go to supplementary motor and premotor areas and these areas will consult basal ganglia and basal ganglia will refine the movement and give special signals or feedback through the thalamus to the premotor, supplementary motor as well as primary motor and somatosensory area. From these areas then fibers will go down as corticospinal or corticonuclear. Any question up to this? You are not confused? Yeah. This is very important when these fibers come to the basal ganglia, then they go to the thalamus and thalamocortical fibers go back to the motor areas, pre-motor, supplementary motor as well as primary motor, even somatosensory area. From the, all those areas, upper motor neurons come down. Am I clear? So can, can we put now basal ganglia exactly where they are in our relationship or functional relationship? The cortex has to consult the basal ganglia and through the thalamus information should go back and then upper motor neurons will fire down. Any question? Now we'll come into detail how the basal ganglia work. Is that right? I want to make a little more beautiful diagram. Now, this is putamen. Right? But actually, uh, in this diagram, I'm showing only putamen, but when I talk about putamen, it should be considered in association with quadrate nucleus. And you know, quadrate nucleus with the putamen are called neostriatum. What are they called? Neostriatum, right? And this is, of course, globus pylorus, right? Now, let's start with the how the system starts. First of all, when you're going to do movement, cortex should, yes, connect with the basal ganglia. So cortical fibers, yes, they come down and they stimulate neurons in neostriatum. They stimulate the neurons in striatum. This is striatum. Again, I'm repeating. Caudate plus, what is this? Putamen. For motor purpose, most of the fibers go to the putamen anyway. So I will call it now onward striatum, but not corpus striatum because when we say corpus striatum, it includes globus pylorus also. I will just say striatum. So these are cortico striatal fiber. What are these? Cortico striatal fibers, right? Then from here, very important connections are going to the, what is this? Globus pylorus internus, right? And from there, From there, fibers are going, what is this, thalamus and then it should loop back and then it should loop back. So what is this, look here, fibers start and this, this is a very simple loop, things are going directly back, this is also called direct pathway, right, now what is direct pathway? We'll talk it later in detail. First of all, what is this? Cortico striatal fiber. Then what are these fibers? Striato pylidal fiber to the internal globus pylorus internum. Then pylidothalamic fiber. Pylidothalamic fiber. Then thalamocortical fibers. Do you think it's difficult to understand? It's so very simple. Now, first of all, I will tell you when you are resting and not doing any movement. What is going on? First we should understand when you are resting and not doing any movement, what is going on in this circuit? And then we'll discuss when movement start, a plan of the movement, you start, right? Then what firing occur, first of all. These red neurons are releasing stimulatory neurotransmitter. Red neurons are releasing stimulatory neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter released by this is glutamate. What is relate, uh, released from here? glutamate and this is also releasing yes glutamate 
so fibers coming from the cortex to basal ganglia are glutaminergic and from thalamus going back are also glutaminergic now when glutamine is released glut glutamate is released from this nerve ending to this dendrite or cell body glutamate receptor will produce cation influx when there will be cationic influx this will get stimulated so glutaminergic fibers will stimulate this first neuron striatal neuron then striatal neuron releases normally what gaba gamma aminobutyric acid plus substance p this neuron when this neuron is stimulated its nerve endings release gamma aminobutyric acid along with the substance p on the neurons of globus pallidus internus right so this neuron should be considered gabergic neuron and the next neuron in the line which is concerned with the pallido thalamic pathway that is also gabergic neuron what is that that is also gabergic neuron and again glutaminergic now first of all i will tell you what happens when you are not doing the movement when you are not doing the movement these corticospinal fibers which are going to come down you know this fiber which was coming down let's suppose i show that fiber here here i show cortico spinal fiber of course they are going down and lower motor neuron going out is that right to a muscle now when you are not doing any movement it means these uh, neurons are not firing is that right it means motor cortex is over functioning or under functioning when you are not doing the movement you look throughout the lecture we'll use the logic when you are not doing the movement motor cortex here should be under functioning or over functioning under functioning it should be inhibited is that right actually how it is kept inhibited when you are not doing the movement actually when you are not doing the movement when you are at rest globus pallidus internus is actively firing when you are not doing the movement globus pallidus internus is actively firing when globus pallidus internus is actively firing it is releasing gaba on thalamus on which nuclei of thalamus basically the nuclei of thalamus is ventro anterior nucleus ventro lateral nucleus centro median nucleus dorso medial nucleus but anyway listen what i am going i am going to tell you that normally when you are at rest you are not doing any movement pallido thalamic fibers are very active right these five pallido thalamic fibers are gabergic fiber gaba releasing fibers and these fibers are keeping releasing lot of gaba in ventro anterior nucleus of thalamus ventro lateral nucleus of thalamus and dorso medial nucleus of thalamus is that right now when gaba is released on these neurons gamma aminobutyric acid is stimulatory neurotransmitter or inhibitory it is inhibitory because when gaba is released on a neuron gaba receptor either allow the chloride influx and make the neurons very hyperpolarized or gaba receptor allow the potassium efflux and again loss of potassium makes the neurons very hyperpolarized so what happens gamma aminobutyric acid is normally released by pallido thalamic fibers right tonically in very high amount when you are resting and they keep the thalamo striatal or oh sorry thalamo cortical fibers inhibited you are understanding when these neurons will be inhibited so naturally can they stimulate this no so movement will not be there you understand it this is what is happening at rest can you repeat it what happens at rest say rapidly there is a heavy firing by pallido thalamic pathway which are gabergic fibers releasing lot of gaba in ventro anterior ventro lateral and dorsal median nuclei of thalamus gaba inhibit these neurons then what happen thalamo cortical fibers are inhibited no action potentials so these fibers do not stimulate the upper motor neurons pyramidal neurons going down to the lower motor neuron that's right now you were resting suddenly a nasty idea came to your mind and you decide to make a certain movement you are going to do certain movement i will not tell what movement but certain movement now if you are going to that certain movement what will happen first of all you need to consult 
बेजल गैंगलिया सेकेंडली दिस इज ऑटोमेटिक ब्रेक अप्लाइड ऑन द बेजल गैंगलिया बेजल गैंगलिया is keeping an automatic brake on the motor system that should be released so exactly what happened when you think of a movement right let's suppose these neurons plan a movement and they stimulate this now cortical striatal fiber will come now cortical striatal fiber they are releasing what thing here yes please glutamate glutamate will stimulate the striato pleidal fibers now when these fibers are stimulated listen glutamate receptors are present here right and glutamate will bind here cations will be loaded and this neuron will become active action potentials will move through and then release here gaba so this first blue neuron a striato pleidal fibers release gaba on pleidal neurons when they will release gaba on the pleidal neuron these pleidal neurons globus pleidus internus neurons will be stimulated or inhibited here inhibited right so let's put it like this first of all these neurons are stimulated when you are planning to movement they are stimulated their activity is going up and when their activity is going up what they release here glutamate when they release the glutamate here what happens to activity of this neuron it goes up so these are also yes stimulated and when these neurons are stimulated striato pleidus internal neuron they release what substance here gaba and when they release gaba what happened to this neuron pleido thalamic pathway there are two important pathway here one is ensa lenticularis other is lenticular fasciculus but anyway important thing is concept here when first inhibitory neuron inhibit the second blue neuron right now this will be inhibited so action potential in this neuron will be more or less less so what happen activity become less here when activity become less here then thalamocortical fibers are released from the pleidal inhibition because when you were resting this these fibers were too much firing and keep the thalamic neurons inhibited but now when you decided to make a movement cortico striatal fiber which are glutaminergic stimulated the strio globus internus fibers when these fibers got stimulated they released inhibitory neurotransmitter on pleidal neurons and pleidothalamic fibers get inhibited and when they get inhibited then there is less gaba release attention please when these fibers get inhibited less gaba release in thalamus so thalamic neurons are less inhibited or you can say they are disinhibited or they escape the inhibition is that right so when they escape the inhibition they start firing and message goes yes message goes to upper motor neurons and they are stimulated and fibers go down lower motor neurons are stimulated and muscle contract any question up to this what is the role of thalamus here thalamus is acting as a relay station right that relay station number 1 number 2 very important thing thalamus has very intimate relationship even though it is at distance with the cerebellum there are lot of uh, you can say fibers coming from cerebellum to eventually through multiple relay to the thalamus so thalamus knows the information in the cerebellum and information in cerebellum is what is the proprioceptive position in the body cerebellum knows which muscle is in which muscle or which joint or which tendon or which uh, ligament is under what type of proprioceptive situation what is the degree of bend at joints or what is the degree of tension at muscles or ligaments or tendons this information from cerebellum is being relayed to thalamus there basal ganglia information and thalamic information they will be computed together and then final decision will go up but that we will talk later right let's come back any question up to this so it's so easy to understand when you are resting this this these blue neurons are over firing lot of gaba in thalamic nuclei thalamic nuclei inhibited thalamocortical fibers inhibited no stimulation to the down going corticospinal cortical nuclear fibers but but when movement you are planning for a movement first of all cortico striatal fibers which are glutaminergic fiber stimulate the striatal neuron 
and striatal neurons when they get stimulated this pathway releases GABA in globus pallidus internus neurons in globus pallidus internus get inhibited then pleidothalamic pathway oh my god yes this get inhibited so pleidothalamic pathway does not release GABA in thalamic system and when inhibitory neuron is deficient here then thalamic neurons are released from the inhibition and they fire upward right to the cortex of course what is this this is going to premotor cortex supplementary motor cortex primary motor area and somatosensory area and there the neurons which are going down they are activated any question here this is called direct pathway right now we'll come to that fussy thing about indirect pathway what is indirect pathway let me tell you there is one more pathway when we start for the movement and let me tell you why we need two pathways listen uh, let's suppose my hand is like this okay my hand is like this and I want to close it right so move planning motor planning should be of two type number one flexors should contract number two extensors should relax are you understanding even when you are going to do any movement these posture your posture should be adjusted right and tone in uh, other muscles where active movement is not done also need to be adjusted is that right for example right now if you are writing something try to write not only your hand muscles will change their movement but you will find shoulder also has change in the move uh, in the tone try it try to write something it means actually basically this is a function of the basal ganglia we originally in our mind we planned to write something with the hand but why all this tone and postural platform is altered this is also all planning by the basal ganglia is that right now one thing which is important as I told you that if I have to close my hand flexors should contract but at the same time extensor should relax it means basal ganglia should have two pathways one pathway should be stimulatory to some muscle group another pathway should be inhibitory to other group it means agonist should be stimulated and antagonist should be inhibited it means there should be one more pathway because this pathway is only stimulatory now we'll talk about the second pathway look here this is when we are planning for the movement another pathway here it is initially it is the same what is it corticostriatal fibers from the these are glutaminergic fibers and from here fibers go to globus pallidus externus not internus you see this is going all the way globus pallidus internus the direct pathway but when we talk about indirect pathway the fibers from striatum go only to the globus pallidus externus from there the next neuron they go to what is this subthalamus right and then from subthalamus glutaminergic neuron go to what is this pleidum and from the pleidum globus pleidus internus now neurons are going to thalamus Now this pathway involves an extra loop. Here the fibers are going from striatum, listen, from striatum directly to globus pallidus internum. So this pathway was direct pathway. Here the fibers are going from striatum to externum, globus pallidus externum, via the subthalamus, go to the globus pallidus internum. Right? So look striatum is influencing the output of globus pallidus internum directly or indirectly via subthalamus so that is why this pathway is called direct pathway and this is called indirect circuit or indirect loop or indirect pathway am i clear so what is indirect pathway where striatum is influencing the activity of globus pallidus internum 
indirectly via a loop through subthalamus. Is that right? Now, how this pathway work? Again, the cortical striatal fibers are glutaminergic and they will stimulate. So again, these fibers are what? When you are planning the movement, these are stimulated. Action potentials are more in these glutaminergic fibers. But these glutaminergic fibers are different than the previous fibers. Because these fibers end up on such striatal neurons which go only up to globus pilus externum. Right? So they will stimulate first these blue neurons. And when these blue neurons will be stimulated, their activity will increase. Is that right? But what they will release on the next neuron? Yes? What they will release? These neurons will release GABA. When GABA will be released, what will happen to the activity of this neuron? It will be inhibited. So we can say activity in this neuron is less. When activity is less in this neuron, right, which is globus pilus externus to subthalamus, when it is less active, it is releasing less GABA on these neurons. Right? When it is releasing less GABA, it means this is less inhibitory. Is that right? So it means this will be released from inhibition. And when these fibers, which are subthalamo palidal fiber, when these fibers are having less GABA influence, they are having less inhibition, or we say they are disinhibited, so they, or they are released from the inhibition, so they overfire. And when these fibers will overfire, they will release a lot of, what is this, glutamate in which area? Globus pilus internum. And when there is glutamate released, that will stimulate this pathway. And when this is stimulated, oh my god, yes, that's right. These fibers will be stimulated. So they will produce more GABA where? In thalamic nuclei. And when there will be more GABA, what will happen? to this neuron. This will be stimulated or inhibited? That will be inhibited. And this will be connected with some those system which need to be inhibited. Maybe in this example, this pathway, this pathway is bringing information eventually to the extensor. So extensors will be inhibited. You are understanding? No problem in this? Why you are looking so happy? You are understanding it? Okay, that's good. I'm happy for you. Now, again, start the direct pathway and then we'll discuss the indirect pathway, then we'll make their comparisons, right? Direct pathway is, now you people will tell me, cortico, striatal fibers, right? But real difference is from here, that strio, Yes, from striatum, gabaragic fibers are directly connected to globus pilus internus and from there fibers are connected to the thalamic nuclei. What is happening? When direct pathway is activated, corticos striatal fibers release glutamate, stimulate the striopleidal fiber, stimulated striopleidal fiber which are gabaragic fibers with release of the substance P, they release GABA on internal pleidus. Globus pilus internus uh, neurons, those neurons are inhibited and when they are inhibited, they, do, they, they don't release GABA in the thalamus. So, thalamic neurons are not inhibited, so they will be overfiring. And when thalamic fibers, which are thalamocortical fibers, they are overfiring, when they will go up, they will stimulate the upper motor neurons. Is that right? For one group of muscles, maybe suppose here flexors. Clear? At the same time, we need to inhibit some other neurons. So we can say, first of all, indirect pathway. Indirect pathway when it is overfiring, cortico, striatal, what will happen? It will stimulate gabaragic neurons which are going from striatum to externum, plidum. They will inhibit the fibers which are going from, yes, plido, subthalamic, and there is less release of GABA release in the subthalamus. So subthalamic neurons are not inhibited anymore. They overfire and release glutamate in globus pilus internum and glutamate stimulates the inhibitory fibers, gabaragic fiber going to the thalamus 
and they release a lot of GABA and inhibit these thalamic neurons and these thalamocortical connections are inhibitory. So what did we see? Direct pathway when it is stimulated, it is stimulatory. Indirect pathway is basically inhibitory. Is that right? Now let's compare and contrast direct and indirect. First of all, direct pathway is shorter pathway and does not involve subthalamus. Indirect pathway is longer pathway and involves the subthalamic connection. Direct pathway when stimulated, eventually it stimulates the thalamocortical fibers. So it is for movement activation. Uh, indirect pathway when it is activated, it actually inhibits the thalamocortical. Some of the, of course, these will be different fiber, those will be different. It inhibits the thalamocortical fibers to inhibit certain upper motor neurons. Is that right? Any question here? There is no problem. Now, this is the basic connections. Now we come to role of dopamine, substantia nigra. Who is clear about this role? Yes, you want to say something. Substantia nigra, what is the role of this? Actually, these are the primary circuit. It is like a fine tuner. It's like modulator. Right? The real action is here, direct and indirect pathway. This will be now doing some modulation. Yes. What? Help in the movement. How? Look, you must be knowing that there is substantia nigra which is present in midbrain derivative of mesencephalon. In whole this pathway, which are the structure which are derivative of telencephalon. Telencephalic structures are uh, caudate, putamen, globus pliedus. Is that right? Telencephalon. Diencephalic structure is what is this? Subthalamus and thalamus. And mesencephalic structure is substantia nigra. Right? It is in the midbrain. Now let's see how the substantia nigra works. This is pars. This is pars compacta, this is pars reticularis, right? Now, actually what happened? Yes. From here, Gabergic, okay, I will not go into this connection, but uh, more important, which is very, very important connection, that from here, what is this? Pars compacta, right? Here are the neurons which are dopaminergic. They release the dopamine. What do they release? They release dopamine and these dopaminergic neurons go up and release dopamine on both pathways. Now these are dopaminergic nerve endings. It means that substantia nigra, dopaminergic fibers, which can also be called nigrostriatal fiber, influence the direct pathway as well as indirect pathway. Is that right? They influence the direct pathway as well as indirect pathway. Actually, these dopaminergic fibers help in initiation of the movement. They facilitate the movement. Now, as I assume all of you are intelligent, so you can tell me if this pathway is supposed to enhance or initiate the movement, kickstart the movement, right? This is the, you can say, kickstarter of the motor system, right? As in the motorcycle, there's a kickstarter. So movement initiator. Now this, this neuron, which is a dopaminergic pathway, it, if it has to facilitate or initiate the movement, you should be able to infer yourself that what should it do to direct pathway and indirect pathway. If it should start the movement, you know direct pathway is excitatory pathway and indirect pathway is inhibitory pathway. If it has to facilitate the movement, right? So direct pathway should be stimulated or inhibited stimulated an indirect pathway should be inhibited so what really happens the nature has provided here d1 receptors when dopamine is released on d1 receptors right these neurons are stimulated and when dopamine is released same dopamine is released on indirect pathway d2 receptors d2 receptor produce inhibition of the neuron paul am i clear what I'm talking about, that the dopaminergic pathway influences the 
releases dopamine in striatum. We call it nigrostriatal pathway, right? In some books it's written, it stimulates some fibers and inhibits other fibers. But some good books are now telling that dopamine release on direct pathway, stimulate the direct pathway, and dopamine release on indirect pathway, inhibit the indirect pathway. The question was that, how one neurotransmitter and one side is stimulating, other side is inhibiting? Now we know the answer. Actually here, in these two places, the receptor for dopamine are different. When D1 receptors are attaching, when dopamine bind with D1 receptor, neurons are stimulated. It means they are cationic loading, cation will go in. But when dopamine will bind with D2 receptor, intracellular signaling will, signaling will eventually lead to cation release from the neuron. So neuron will be inhibited. Is that right? Now, rest of the story should be very simple. What should happen? When dopaminergic system is facilitating the movement, and dopaminergic system is facilitating the movement, what should it do? It should stimulate direct pathway. It means direct pathway is stimulated. Is that right? What will happen? More GABA coming here. And internal is, uh, neurons in glibus and colitis internum are inhibited. And they are further released and more firing for direct movement. Right? At the same time, uh, this is producing a very fine balance. That at the same time, they are inhibiting the indirect pathway. Because G2, when this neuron is inhibited, then less, now here it is reverse, not what is shown. Actually, it will become less active. What is this? Under the influence of dopamine, right? and less active, so it will release less GABA here, so this pathway will be less inhibited, so produce more GABA, more GABA will inhibit it a lot, and this activity will go down, so it will not be stimulated, it will be less active. Are you understanding? And when it is less active, less GABA over here, this will be also released. So basically, dopaminergic firing on both sides increase the action. Are you are looking a bit confused? I'm so confused about the second the second. Indirect pathway. Yeah, it, let me tell you. When we talk about corticostriatal system, right? This stimulate the this pathway increases the movement. And when corticostriatal pathway comes to indirect, it decreases the movement, right? Yeah. Right? But when we talk about dopamine, right? Nigrostriatal pathway. Is that right? What it has to do, it has to facilitate the movement more. For this purpose, especially it stimulates the direct pathway. I told you direct pathway is excitatory pathway or movement initiatory pathway. This is because concerned with the antagonist, right? This is inhibitory pathway. So listen, again, final movement occur depend on what thing? Motor cortex activity. Depends on what thing? Motor and cortex activity. Now, motor cortex activity is normally increased by direct pathway, normally decreased by indirect pathway. Is that right? But if nigrostriatal facilitates the desired movement, desired movement is supposed to take close my hand. So, for this purpose, it should enhance the activity in direct pathway and inhibit the activity in indirect pathway. Am I clear? Are you clear or not? How the cortex talk to the this thing? Yes, I was thinking that one of you should be really intelligent. That how the substantial nigra neurons know when to fire and which group of neurons to fire and readjust. Of course, they have very close relationship. What are these fibers? Corticonigral fiber. So this information, substantia nigra knows what is the planning going on and it will further fine tune it. Is that right? Any question up to this? Yeah, but it is less inhibitory. If, let me tell you, exactly tell you how, what it happens. Basically, when you plan a movement, body has a tendency to overshoot in the movement. So we have to find regulators. We will get this concept more clear when I talk about Parkinsonism. When this pathway is destroyed, what happens? 
Okay, let me tell you. Forget about this pathway. I'll start another pathway here. Uh, it should go through this. Actually, I've put it on the same neuron. That is why it is disturbing. Now, what is happening? This dopamine. Can I yeah, you can explain. Why not? Come over here and explain. <laughs> No problem, it's okay. You are still in learning phase. If you make a mistake, still you should be appreciated for coming over to the board. Okay, so we are releasing dopamine here. Yeah. D2 receptors right here. Yes. Right? So we are trying, we're trying to mature. So we'll get the... Look, she, I will uh, tell them what you are saying. You are saying when dopamine will come over here, it has D2 receptors. Yeah, so so this get inhibited. Right. When it get inhibited, yeah, right, uh, you will stand there so that they can see it. When this will get inhibited, right, then it will release less GABA and this will not be inhibited. Its activity will go up. When its activity will go up, this right, this will be inhibited. But actually, there should be another connection here, ideally speaking. Is that right? So what happens when there will be more GABA here, this specific neuron will be inhibited. When this neuron will be inhibited, there is less stimulation to another GABA, right? And what happens? That will become less excited because it was stimulatory right. so that will be less excited less excited means less inhibition to the next and that will be positive result but we don't want positive right? let me tell let me tell you we want positive let me tell you now we have seen a direct pathway is that right and we have seen indirect pathway. Indirect pathway is defined as a pathway in which subthalamus is involved, right? Now we know dopaminergic action on the direct pathway, no problem. Now we dopaminergic action on indirect pathway. The point which you have to understand that glutaminergic activity and dopaminergic activity are antagonist to each other on these neurons. Is that right? What is happening? They are antagonist to each other. Now how exactly it happened? I'm going to draw this complex here. Suppose this is the neuron, right? Here it is releasing glutamate, is that right? And let's suppose on the same neuron, what is being released here? Dopamine, right? So here is dopamine 2 receptors. Dopamine 2 receptors and here it is glutamate. Now what is happening? This is loading the cations in. And this is the removing the cation. What will be the action? That will be the net of them. Am I clear? Zero. Not necessarily zero. Maybe this is released more and this is less. But what do you need that? A fine tuning, fine tuning. There's a concept of fine tuning because we don't want it over inhibition in this pathway. Is that right? Or over stimulation in this pathway. So what happens that this is stimulating the direct, what is this? Indirect pathway, this is inhibiting. And both of them are putting a balance there. Now what happens? If the more action potential coming from here and the less action potential coming here, net effect will be stimulation. If the less action potential from here and more action potential from here, net effect will be inhibition. How it happens that now, I think this is a very basic concept. In the neuronal cell body, then dendrite, there, potential membrane potential keep on fluctuating depending upon the balance of stimulatory and inhibitory activity is that right and neuron will fire or not it depends on what is the net potential in that for example threshold potential is let's suppose this is having a resting membrane potential minus 90 millivolt right threshold potential is suppose plus 20 is that right now what happened in this neuron, resting membrane potential is fluctuating like this. When this is firing, cations are loaded, it's, so this is resting membrane potential and this is threshold, minus 70. When cations are coming, this potential is going upward and from this side. But when this is firing, this potential is going downward. So depending upon what is the net effect, frequency of action potentials will be determined. Yeah, that's right. Resting membrane potential has to reach to the threshold, only then it will fire. 
But if resting neuron potential goes above the threshold, then frequency of action potential will be changed. More it is above the threshold, more higher frequency of action potential. Is that right? We have gone away from the topic. Let's go back. Listen again. Rather than making a new pathway, for simplicity purpose, even though different pathways do exist, for simplicity purpose, I will say that neurons in the striatum, neurons in the striatum are under the glutaminergic effect from the cortico-striatal pathway and they are under dopaminergic effect from nigro-striatal pathway, right? Again, but neurons in the striatum which are going to turn globus pilaris internum, they are having D1 receptors. And neurons in the striatum, which are going to the globus pilaris externum, they are having D2 receptors. Right? Is that clear? Now, when nigrostriatal fibers fire, right, they have stimulatory action on the direct pathway and enhance the movement. Right? And they have inhibitory action on the indirect pathway and by that they inhibit the movement. Am I clear? They inhibit or enhance? Now this is the question. Again enhance. Let's remove it because this is for that action. Let's start with D2 now. Previous this, this is shown these arrows are actually depicting action of glutamate on this neuron. Now I'm going to draw the arrows according to the action of dopamine. Right? Now you see dopaminergic action. Again I will repeat first direct and then indirect. You people will tell me. When dopamine released on direct pathway, what will happen to this neuron? Under fire, over fire? Over fire. Now you see. It means this neuron over fires on glutaminergic stimulation as well as over fires on dopaminergic stimulation. So both of them, cortico, what is this corticostriatal fiber, the nigrostriatal fiber, both of them stimulate the direct pathway. When it is stimulated, of course, more GABA here, then these fibers are inhibited and less GABA in the, what is this, thalamus and thalamocortical fibers are released from inhibition and more activation. Clear? Here, here they are antagonist because corticostriatal fibers are stimulating the neuron, gabergic neuron here. But nigrostriatal fibers are inhibiting it. So they are antagonizing action of each other. Now we see purely the action of uh, nigrostriatal pathway. When nigrostriatal pathway is stimulated, indirect pathway also receives more dopamine because it has D2 receptors. So what happens when D2 receptor is there? Yes. More dopamine here. These neurons get inhibited. The neurons get inhibited, the next neuron are not inhibited at all. So they will overfire. Am I clear? When they will overfire, they will release too much GABA here and inhibit these neurons. And when they will inhibit the glutaminergic neuron from the subthalamus going to the globus pilaris, less glutamate here, less stimulation of the pilaris fibers, and less stimulation means their activity will become less and less inhibition of thalamic nuclei right when there's less inhibition to this they will overfire and what will happen that under the effect of dopamine direct pathway is also stimulated and eventually indirect pathway also has stimulatory action in the end on the motor cortex yes please your question when gamma goes down Come over here. Exactly tell me where you are talking about. Come, come. Yes. Um, your question is anywhere. You put your finger and tell me your question. If, if, your question is about the GABA. Right. When, when, when you increase, wait, 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 I don't know where it is now. But basically when you're increasing GABA, mm -hmm. you're decreasing the firing on the subsequent neurons. Neuron, yes. How it happens. How that is what you want to know. If, yeah, if, if, if I'm, I understand. I'm going to explain it. Okay. Have a seat. He is dragging me into little micro detail. He's saying 
when one neuron releases GABA on other, how the other neuron is inhibited? That is your question. No, no, I'm sorry. Oh my God. That's not my question. Okay, what is your question then? The question is when you're turning down GABA. When you reduce GABA. You reduce GABA, but the next neuron increases its firing because right. it's being released, it's being allowed to fire. Right, now listen. Who's causing the second neuron to fire? Very good. His question is this. That if first neuron is releasing less GABA, yes. then I, th I usually make a statement that the next neuron is released from the inhibitory action and it overfires. Question is that why it overfires? First of all, listen, these neurons dendrite are very promiscuous. They have connection with multiple different neurons, connected with inhibitory and stimulatory, all those neurons. This is one thing. So, usually, one mechanism is a multiple mechanism. One mechanism is that this neuron may be under inhibitory neurotransmitters as well as stimulatory and when inhibitory is dominating right it is keeping it away from the threshold but as soon as this become off then other influences which are stimulatory they will win over this is one mechanism another mechanism is let me tell you some of these neurons which have a tendency to auto fire they have sodium leaky channels right they have sodium leaky channels so all the time some sodium is trickling in right but this not okay i should make it a different color because you should not confuse with gaba suppose these are sodium leaky channel cation leaky channel all the time some cations are going in and this is the gaba which is for example this is gaba a receptor and when gaba act on this receptor chloride goes in now cations are coming from there but chloride is going from there so what will happen that effect of cations which are coming in is neutralized by this. Is that right? And this is not allowed to fire. Am I clear? Second mechanism is GABA B receptors, they are associated with serpentine G inhibitory system. When GABA bind with GABA B receptors, they stimulate the G inhibitory neuron, uh, protein and that actually stimulate alpha inhibitory and beta gamma unit. Beta gamma unit basically stimulate potassium channels and potassium is normally more inside listen and GABA bind with GABA B receptors these receptors are coupled with G proteins and G inhibitory beta gamma unit bind with the potassium channels some special potassium channels and they open because potassium is more in the cell potassium start going out so GABA has two mechanisms to keep the neurons inhibited either by loading the neuron by with anions, chloride or helping the cations to escape so neuron remain electronegative more and more electronegative when GABA is less either chlorides are not loaded or potassium is not allowed to leak out and if potassium is not allowed to leak out it start accumulating and take the resting through threshold am I clear? okay any more question? no question? okay let's come back so what we are talking about you understand these two things? right now another thing you may be thinking what is this what is this thing pars reticularis pars reticularis substantia nigra actually ideally pars reticularis should be considered downward displaced globus pallidus internum because this pars reticularis and globus pallidus internum have the same connection so these days pars reticularis of substantia nigra should be functionally considered more like globus pallidus internum than to, to be the uh, to function like substantia nigra pars compacta this thing should be clear it means that the, this should also have fibers as globus pallidus internum has fibers going to thalamus this also should have fibers going to the thalamus is that right? It should also receive gabergic fiber. Is that right? So as gabergic fibers are going to globus pallidus, what is this? Internum, in the same way, gabergic fibers also come, okay, gabergic fiber also come to, what is this? Globus, what is this? Substantia nigra. Compare this, as these fibers are going there, there are also fibers coming here. And from here, which fibers are going forward? Gabergic. From here also, fibers should be gabergic. Is that right? 
but going no need to go into this detail just remember that pars reticularis is just a functionally displaced downward caudally displaced piece of gray matter from the globus pallidus internum is that right okay after having all this discussion now the last word about this thing as i told you the direct pathway and indirect pathway are under the influence of what is this thing dopamine and uh, dopaminergic pathway stimulate the yes direct pathway and inhibit the indirect pathway then there is also counter balance also on them what is that counter balance counter balance is that within the within the striatum there are cholinergic neurons and these cholinergic neurons have influence here as well as here but they have opposite their their action is exactly opposite of dopamine you know biological system is trying to balance itself so dopamine had stimulatory action on direct pathway so acetylcholine will have which action on the direct pathway inhibitory and acetylcholine will have what action on indirect pathway stimulatory is that right if you cannot remember that most important utmost important is you remember the action of dopamine right on direct and indirect pathway and then remember acetylcholine is opposite to that any question here done now i'm going to remove this diagram and rapidly make it and you are going to tell me where which neurotransmitter is being released if you satisfy me only then i will move ahead in the lecture then i will tell you the pathologies of these pathways first review the physiology rapidly yes i'm drawing the structure then you have to tell me what is this structure cortex yes what is this nucleus lentiform putamen striatum internum externum substantia nigra what is this here subthalamus here is your friend thalamus now you will tell me pathway these are coming from cortex these fibers are cortico striatal i will make two pathway cortico striatal one for direct other for indirect they release what substance here glutamate then what is this what are these fibers going gabergic or glutaminergic and again from here what fibers are going gabergic and what are these fibers thalamo striatal what are these glutaminergic what is this pathway direct pathway is that right again tell me rapidly what happens when this pathway fires what happened to this neuron over fire more gaba here what will happen to this neuron under fire less gaba in thalamus thalamo striate is so thalamo cortical pathway is released and stimulation of motor cortex and motor activity enhanced is that right now i'm going to make indirect pathway yes any question up to this now you have to tell me rapidly these pathways are gl glutaminergic they stimulate this blue neuron first neuron when this is stimulated this will release more gaba in corp uh, what is this area globus pallidus sternus the neurons there are stimulated or inhibited when more gaba come these are inhibited when they are inhibited they don't release gaba here when gaba is not released what will happen this will over fire and that will lead to over stimulation of gabergic fiber going from pallidum to thalamus more gaba here and these fibers will be inhibited so actually when direct and indirect both path pathways are firing then some of the thalamo cortical fiber that stimulated and other that inhibited is that right it means when we are doing initiating the movement or planning the movement actually some of the 
motor cortex need to be stimulated and other part need to be inhibited. Is that clear? Okay. Then what was here? From here also GABAergic neurons do come here but there and to here. But more important concept is what is this? From pars compacta which fibers are going up? Yes. Here are D1 receptors and in or indirect pathway there are D2 receptors. So dopaminergic pathway, nigrostriatal pathway stimulate the direct pathway and inhibit the indirect pathway. Is that clear? Of course when it will stimulate the direct pathway then this pathway will become more stimulated so it facilitate the movement at the same time it will inhibit the indirect pathway and when it will inhibit the indirect pathway then indirect pathways inhibit reaction will be less so more stimulation clear any question up to this there is no now we come to the dysfunctions of these pathways actually when the, the, these circuits are disturbed motor movement become abnormal motor movement become abnormal in some kind of lions in some kind kind of lions motor movement become less we say there is a hypokinesia and in other kind of lions motor movement become more and we call them hyperkinesia so it means basal ganglia lion in some diseases can produce hypokinesia and in other diseases it can produce hyperkinesia or dyskinesia. Dyskinesia are that when you are resting but producing abnormal movements. Is that right? I told you this is what? Purpose of basal ganglia is to initiate the movement as well as program the movement. Right? Now, let's see if there is a lien in direct pathway what will happen? If there is an injury to direct pathway what will happen? The classical example of that is when direct pathway is less stimulated when there is injury to direct pathway it is under functioning now in under what circumstances this can under function one of the classical example is parkinsonism right you know in patient with parkinsonism what happened to them this is very difficult for them to initiate the movement the movements are slow. If movements are slow, we say there is hypokinesia. And if movements are very less or not there, we say akinesia. Patients who have Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease, they have three problems. Number one, they have hypokinesia. Hypokinesia means less movement. But truly speaking, the difficulty is in initiating the movement. It is difficult to initiate the movement and movement velocity and extent become less. So we say hypokinesia. Second problem there is rigidity. I will explain all these things. Third problem is primers. Now, hypokinesia. Why this is hypokinetic syndrome? Why it happens so? Listen now. Let's start. What is the primary problem and the real problem in Parkinson's disease? The real problem in Parkinson's disease is degeneration of the neurons in pars compacta of substantia nigra. When these neurons degenerate, then release of dopamine, then release of dopamine from nigrostriatal pathway is less. For example, 50% neuron or suppose 80% neurons here are degenerated. So it means the release of dopamine in striatum is less. Now we will see if dopamine is less, what will happen? Is that right? What was happening? Normally, first of all. Normally, what happened? When we have you have to initiate a movement, corticostriatal fibers fire, dopamine, uh, sorry, glutamate released normally then these gabaergic fibers over fire is that right more GABA come over in plidum plidal fibers are plidothalamic fibers are inhibited normally and then what happens in normal person thalamo cortical fibers over fire and stimulate the motor cortex to 
start the movement. Now, what is the normal function of D1? It is stimulating this pathway. That is what we know already. Now we see that dopaminergic activity here is less. These neurons are degenerated. Now, if dopaminergic activity is less here, then what will happen? Here is less stimulation, more stimulation. Less stimulation. It means that these neurons will activity will be less than normal. Is that right? Again, in Parkinson's disease, where neurons degenerate in pars compacta of substantia nigra, what really happens? The release of dopamine is less here. When there is less stimulation of D1 receptors, then these fibers, which are striopleidal, striatoploidal fibers, they are not as active as they should be to initiate the movement. They are less active because they are no more stimulated by D1 receptors. When they are less active, they are releasing less dopamine. They are releasing less dopamine in pleidum. When they are releasing less dopamine in pleidum, then pleidal neurons are less inhibited or they are disinhibited. Am I clear? So what will happen to these neurons? They will slightly overfire. When they will slightly overfire, there is slightly more GABA in thalamus and if there is more GABA in thalamus, thalamocortical fibers are inhibited. So this activity is less. So thalamocortical neuronal activity is less than motor cortex is stimulated less. If motor cortex is stimulated less due to less stimulatory action of D1 receptors on direct pathway, if this activity is less it is easy to initiate the movement or difficult to initiate the movement. It is easy to start a movement or difficult to start a movement. Yes? Difficult to start the movement, right? Any question about this system? Now, second. Of course, when uh, in Parkinson's disease, the nigrostriatal pathway not only provide less dopamine on direct pathway, they also provide less dopamine on indirect pathway. When indirect pathway is having less dopamine, it means now D2 receptors are less stimulated and when D2 receptors are less stimulated, what happens to these neurons? They are less inhibited because D2 receptors inhibit the neuron, this specific neuron. So what will happen that they are less inhibited, so they will underfire or overfire? Yeah? When they will overfire, more GABA here and this neuron will under fire, so less in GABA here and less inhibition to this and now subthalamocleidal fibers will, yes, over fire and that will lead to stronger stimulation of pleidal neurons and when pleidal neurons are strongly stimulated, they release more GABA in thalamus and when more GABA is here, now these neurons are also inhibited. So what happened? That direct pathway as well as indirect pathway, when both pathways have lost dopaminergic activity, both of them lead to less stimulation of motor cortex. When motor cortex has less stimulation, then what will happen? It will become difficult to initiate the movement, right? And we say patient has hypokinesia or akinesia. This person, if he has to walk, he will walk slowly, his posture will be stooped and he will be walking with very little steps. Is that right? Even if this person is standing, you push him, he start walking. You initiate him a little. Rather than nigrostriatal pathway, you push him. So he start. But it is difficult for him to stop now because for stopping you need different kind of movement. Initiate the opposite muscles. You are understanding? So in Parkinson's disease, they find it so difficult to initiate the movement that their face look like mask face because they don't show expression. Normally when someone is interacting with you, your facial expression keep on changing. To change the facial expression, muscles of facial expression should work and motor cortex should work. You know when to smile and when to frown and when to do blink, is that right? But a person who is having this problem, Parkinsonism, nigrostriatal, can he initiate the movements? Even to smile or to frown or to blink, they find it difficult. Sometimes they don't blink for a very long time. We call that as if they are having serpentine look. 
with mask face as if they are having a mask on the face without any expressions you are understanding now then rigidity actually uh, when you check the tone right tone across the muscles what happens motor cortex motor cortex is having some action on their cortical reticular fibers and from the reticular formation fibers go to spinal cord which control the tone so cortical reticulo and reticulo spinal fibers is that right they control the tone now what happened when cortex is inhibited then cortical reticulo fibers are working less when cortical reticulo fibers are working less reticular formation over fires right let me draw a diagram these are cortical reticular fiber and these are reticular spinal fibers and they determine the tone is that right now what happens when cortical activity is less then cortical reticular fiber activity is less is that right normally cortical reticular fibers inhibit the reticular formation when these fibers are working less then they overwork and they overfire and increase the tone now when muscles tone will increase on flexors and extensors both right muscles on flexors and extensor both sides are more strongly contracted at rest so tone is increased on flexor and extensors both so what happen when you try to flex his arm it is very difficult and when you try to extend it is also very difficult you feel as if you are moving as if limb is like a rigid lead pipe you know lead pipe when you are bending the lead pipe all the range of the movement you have difficulty so this type of rigidity is called what kind of rigidity lead pipe rigidity is that right lead piping or lead pipe rigidity there another thing which is there is attention i told you previously that here there are cholinergic fibers and cholinergic fibers have opposite action on these two as compared to dopamine now you have to see here that dopaminergic action and cholinergic actions are opposite to each other right we can say for normal function for normal motor function there should be balance in dopaminergic activity and cholinergic activity in the striatum is that clear now what happened when dopaminergic activity go down the relative activity of cholinergic become more is that right am i clear or not when parkinson's disease do when these neurons are damaged dopaminergic activity become less then cholinergic activity become unchecked because normally dopaminergic activity is exactly opposite to cholinergic activity dopamine was uh, inhibiting the uh, sorry stimulating the direct pathway and inhibiting the indirect pathway acetylcholine is inhibiting the direct pathway and stimulating the indirect now when dopaminergic activity become more another thing happens there are a lot of motor programs here and there are some circuits which are called reverberating circuit reverberating circuit mean that neuron is going forward some fibers come back and re stimulate the previous neuron so action potential to move in a circus are you understanding me that within this system there are some neurons which are making reverberating circuits circuit mean fibers like this action to the moving like this when dopamine is less and acetylcholine is unchecked these reverberating circuit become fast when they become fast what happen even during the resting conditions agonist and antagonist keep on working in alternate fashion flexor flexors extensors keep on working in alternate movement what will that produce tremors and what are these tremors resting tremors you are understanding so imbalance of dopamine and acetylcholine producing pill rolling resting tremor right stooped posture mask face difficulty to initiate the movements and if you really walk with shuffling gait any question up to this pardon 
uh, why we have these reverberating uh, systems here actually what happens sometimes they act as an amplifier let me tell you how reverberating pathway this is a neuron we stimulate the next neuron that stimulate the next neuron right now what happened from here one connection come and stimulate it from here another connection come and stimulate it so you gave one stimulus here when it one stimulant went ahead it bifurcated here and automatically second pathway went ahead from here a third stimulus went ahead so in this way you can sustain certain flow of action potential you are understanding it so these are present over here to maintain specific tone and flexors and extensors when reverberating circuits are disturbed right listen now if i'm keeping my hand like this resting position there's a specific tone degree of contraction and flexor and extensor and i'm making it steady is that right now if reverberating circuits are disturbed sometimes they will over flex then they will try to correct it and over extend then they will again try to correct it and over flex so in this effort they will produce resting primers am i clear no problem right okay this is what happens in Parkinson's disease. In Parkinson's disease, there are different types of Parkinsonism. One Parkinson's disease with nigrostriatal pathway is degenerated. Then another condition which was called MPTP associated Parkinsonism. Actually, this was a situation which was discovered in California that some young people were getting Parkinson's like features. So doctors are very upset. Usually this is an old age disease. Then they came to know most of them were actually heroin addict and they were taking street heroin the heroin which was provided to those people was of low quality i mean there was some contaminant in that and that contaminant was methyl phenyl tetrapyridine anyway this was a substance which was contaminating that heroin or addiction material and when they were taking this material they came to know this compound mptp could damage the nigrostriatal neurons and what was happening patients were developing in very young age parkinson's disease like situation so this was called nptp associated parkinson's disease then parkinson's like situation can also occur if you are giving a patient dopamine receptor blockers if some patient is given dopamine receptor blocker the drugs are antipsychotic drugs if those drugs are given and these receptors are blocked Functionally, it is like losing the nigrostriatal pathway. So sometimes, when you, you when you give the patient antipsychotic drug, they may come after two weeks back, and now they say, "Okay, our psychosis is okay or not?" But we have developed new problem. We have this shaky palsy, and we cannot move around. You understand it? So that is drug-induced Parkinsonism. Anyway, this was few words about Parkinsonism. So this was a classical example where in the deficiency of dopamine lead to reduced stimulation of direct pathway and reduced stimulation of direct pathway eventually reduces the action in motor cortex and hypokinesia occur. Any question here? Now I will talk about diseases, disorders of basal ganglia which produce hyperkinesia or dyskinesia. Remember, basal ganglia lions don't produce paralysis. Either they reduce the movement or they increase or produce abnormal movement. Now, you have understood how the hypokinesia can occur. Now, I, I will try to explain you that if there is some damage to specially indirect pathway. Look, if direct pathway does not work, you have hypokinesia. Now, I will explain if there is damage to indirect pathway, you may develop excessive and abnormal movement that is hyperkinesia or dyskinesia let me explain how it happens i think by now you must be able to teach it to some of your friends am i right or wrong mm -hmm. yes this is your pathway. You just tell me what pathway I've drawn, direct or indirect right now. Yes? 
it is direct pathway and lesions of direct pathway produce hypokinesia but now i am going to explain lesions of indirect pathway to draw the indirect pathway yes yes this is your indirect pathway right and as you know that here it was in both pathways were influenced by dopamine right we have already discussed previously if dopaminergic activity is less here it will produce hypokinesia but now we will talk about something else let's suppose problem is with indirect pathway let us suppose that due to some disease these neurons are degenerated or damaged if these neurons are damaged can indirect pathway work can indirect pathway work no now what happens if due to any reason these neurons degenerate which neurons gabergic neuron which are participating in indirect pathway is that right but direct pathway is intact remember these two neurons are slightly different these were gabergic neuron with substance p these were gabergic neuron with enkephalin so some diseases preferentially damage these neurons and other diseases preferentially damage other neurons so let's suppose there is a disease or let me tell you the name of the disease huntington's disease have you heard of it right in huntington's disease on chromosome number i will go into detail of huntington's later just for a while you trust me what happens these gabergic neurons degenerate if these gabergic neurons degenerate now you will tell me action on these neurons will be less or more less of course if 90% are degenerated GABA in this area will be less so when action of these neurons will be less GABA will be less so these neurons will be kept inhibited or not so they will overwork or underwork when plido subthalamic fibers will overwork right when GABAergic neurons in the striatum participating in indirect pathway degenerate or dysfunction then gabergic neuron from globus pallidus to subthalamus are released from inhibition the overwork and too much gaba is here and when too much gaba is here that will inhibit these neurons so there is less stimulation to what is this pallidal neurons are you understanding me when pleidal neurons are less stimulated <coughs> they're less glutamate here they're less stimulated so they will fire more or less again i know you are tired again these neurons are degenerated right now they are overworking there's too much gaba released in subthalamus subthalamic neurons are inhibited so subthalamic neurons release less glutamate in globus pallidus internum so globus pallidus internum neurons are less stimulated by glutamate so because they are less stimulated so they will be less active is that right when they are less active listen here when they are less active so GABA released in thalamus is less and thalamic neurons when total amount of GABA in the thalamus become less inhibitory influence on the thalamus is less so ventro anterior nucleus and ventro lateral nucleus will over fire and when they are over firing all the time they are over stimulating many neurons here going down and that may be producing excessive unwanted movements is that right and we say there is hyperkinesia or dyskinesia so this was in parkinson is a classical example of genesis of genesis of hypokinesias and this was a genesis of yes hyper or dyskinesias more movement or excessive movement or abnormal movement is that right any question in these two comparisons anyone who is not clear if you are not clear now i will commit suicide is it really clear okay 
now let's see what kind of hyperkinesia uh, uh, what kind of hyperkinesia can be there okay there are different types of hyperkinesia we can say there are choreas there is athetosis there are dystonias and there are bellissimus or hemibellissimus all of them are excessive movement and there are tardive dyskinesias i will explain all of them don't worry i think it will you will worry more now if i explain tardive dyskinesias okay there are others also but let me explain these first okay wilson's disease chorea has a huntington's chorea huntington's chorea uh chorea also can be part of saint vitus dance saint vitus dance or saint vitus dance is also called sydenham's chorea sydenham's chorea and there is another disease called wilson disease i will explain them one by one in all of these diseases the dominant lien is in indirect pathway so in all of these diseases movement will be less or more yes there will be excessive abnormal movement now first of all chorea what is chorea yes it's north chorea or south chorea yes what is chorea i have you seen michael jackson dance <laughs> michael jackson dance is somewhat like chorea sudden brisk purposeless flying movements of the limbs uncontrollable what is this chorea is basically damage to this system right and when this uh, gabergic neurons in the what is this caudate nucleus are damaged especially not in putamen and gabergic neurons in caudate nucleus are damaged striatum right what really happens indirect pathways dysfunctional right and many motor programs are abnormally released i will tell you exactly how the chorea is produced many motor programs are abnormally released what i told you that when this pathway is inhibited then actually okay sorry it should be here when this pathway is not working eventually what will happen motor cortex will be under stimulated or over stimulated over stimulated now if motor cortex is over stimulated or from this area over stimulated signals are going now in your central nervous system you have different program for example this is a program to raise your hand right and salute someone this is the program to bye bye there is another program you can run for example right there is another program now these are different programs which are there and you only use them in specific situation now if indirect pathway is disturbed and motor cortex is over stimulated it may release multiple program in in a haphazard fashion for example you are going to salute but half of the movement go suddenly it goes like this and then suddenly another program is leaking like leaking leaking of the program right in appropriate release of the program for scratching here but you come here and then suddenly goes like this so what happens in chorea from central nervous system motor programs which are stored there are haphazardly released or their components are released and they result into sudden uncontrollable or involuntary purposeless movement you understand chorea so it's just like a michael jackson latest dance is that right now how chorea can occur one chorea is huntington's chorea you will study in detail in pathology but i will just tell you in huntington's chorea what happen that problem is it is inherited disorders in huntington's chorea chromosome number 4 on chromosome number 4 there is a special gene which is called huntington gene in this gene trinucleotide repeat cag they are amplified 
trinucleotide repeat are amplified and when trinucleotide repeats are too much amplified that produces an abnormal protein which is toxic that toxic protein damages the gabergic neuron as well as cholinergic neurons is that right so what will be the result basal ganglia dysfunction and that will result into coriform movement with that these patients also develop depression and dementia is that right and in chorea disease uh, all the features of trinucleotide repeat diseases are there for example trinucleotide repeat diseases get progressively worse generation after generation so on tickton's chorea also get worse generation after generation father has less chorea and son will have or less severe disease son will have more severe disease grandson will have very severe disease secondly because ev after every generation trinucleotide repeat amplify disease get worse why the trinucleotide repeat amplify because during oo genesis or spermatogenesis trinucleotide repeats are over copied so children have more repeat than the parents you understand me now so generation after generation Huntington's disease get more severe and appear at younger age. Is that right? What happens in Huntington's disease? That specially head of the caudate nucleus degenerate and lateral ventricle looks as if it is abnormally widened because head, head of the caudate nucleus is no more occupying its normal anatomical position. Am I clear? Or should I draw a diagram? It's really clear. She just want to leave the lecture now. I understand. Okay, so Huntington's chorea is inherited disorder, autosomal dominant, related with trinucleotide repeat amplification. Disease get worse generation after generation, and the disease appears at younger age, generation after generation. Is that right? Because trinucleotide repeat over amplify during gametogenesis. Is that right? And trinucleotide repeat which amplify they consist of cytosine what is this adenine and guanine but you can remember caudate nucleus having less acetylcholine and having less GABA caudate nucleus having less acetylcholine and less GABA cholinergic and GABAergic neurons are damaged patient has classically abnormal motor move, coriform movement with that there is what else is there with coriform movement depression and dementia is that right then there is St. Vitus dance or other name is Sedenham's chorea. This type of problem is more common in girls and this is seen, this is another type of chorea, purposeless, sudden, brisk, uncontrollable movement. Uh, if you really want to have chorea, try to get this one, not the other one. Huntington's, if it once start, it is progressive. St. Vitus dance or Sedenham's chorea is transient chorea. It occurs in the patient with rheumatic fever. Some people, especially in younger age, when they get streptococcal infection with beta hemolytic organism, right? Some of these children develop cross immunological reaction, and that immunological re immune system, which is supposed to, when streptococcal infection produce sore throat, immune system should specifically fire back against the streptococci. But unfortunately, immune system also produce some component which react with our own tissues. It means immune system cross react. We are supposed to fire against the bacteria, but also fire against our own tissue. And if this immune reaction injures the caudate and produces inflammation in caudate, then patient may get chorea. But usually it is short term chorea, right? When this rheumatic fever become okay, chorea will be terminated. Am I clear? Then there is another disease in which chorea can occur that is called Wilson disease. In Wilson disease, what happens that this is a uh, this is inherited disorder of copper metabolism that there is a protein called ceruloplasmin ceruloplasmin level is less in the blood and copper accumulate into liver and copper accumulate in the cornea and copper accumulate into caudate nucleus and lentiform nucleus right so it damages the liver and damages the lenticular nucleus so we call it hepatolenticular disease what we call it hepatolenticular disease or wilson disease it is copper overloading disease right in which in the blood in the liver copper is more in the blood ceruloplasmin is less and urine loses a lot of 
copper. There is excessive excretion of copper in urine. Now, in these patients, when copper damages the liver, patient develops cirrhosis or liver failure eventually. When copper damages the basal ganglia, patient develop coriform movements or dystonias. And when copper deposits into cornea, in the cornea there is a decimase membrane. You must have studied in anatomy. You don't know there's cornea? Yeah. yeah, cornea. Cornea is one of the layer which is called decimase membrane. Copper loves to deposit there. And when copper deposits into decimase membrane, it makes a special ring in the cornea. That is called Kaser Fleschner ring. Right? I don't know the spellings, you can write it like this. Kaser Fleschner ring. Right? So Kaser Fleschner ring is deposition of copper in the cornea. In which disease? Wilson's disease. This is hepatolenticular disease. Is that right? Cirrhosis can occur in the liver and it can damage the basal ganglia and produce abnormal motor movement. Clear? Yeah, it is damage. Uh, it is progressive damage and it is uh, related with chromosome number 13. Right? This genetic inherited disorder. If you really if you are really desperate to get chorea, try to get Sydenham's chorea. Right? That occurs in children usually between 4 to 14 year, 15 year or up to 20 year. All of you are above that. Uh, but rheumatic fever may have chorea as a part of it. Right? That is Sydenham's chorea. Or sometimes females when they get pregnant in second trimester, they get the Sydenham's chorea. That is also called chorea gravidarum. That chorea of the pregnancy. But it's rare. Don't worry. Okay, you want to know rheumatic fever. Okay, very briefly I will tell you. In rheumatic fever, what happened? Special type of streptococci, beta hemolyticus, Lansfield group A, rheumatogenic strain. This special strain attacks the strepto, uh, throat. Most of the people, when they get this infection, most of the children, they make antibodies which only damage the bacteria. We are happy. But in 3% of the children, unfortunately, when these bacteria attack the throat, immune system fire back against the bacteria, but also attack some of our own tissue which have some antigens which are like bacterial antigens. It means the immune system is really stupid. Rather than making very specific antibodies against the bacteria, it also makes antibodies which also cross react with our own tissue. So those antibodies may cross react with our cardiac tissue or with the synovial membrane. So patient may have carditis, myocarditis, pericarditis or endocarditis or polyarthritis in skin lesions or the he may have chorea or some nodules in subcutaneous tissue. You will study this in pathology one day hopefully. Right? Anyway, so Huntington's can produce chorea which is due to degeneration of gabergic and cholinergic neurons. Right? Wilson's disease can produce chorea, copper deposition there. St. Vitus chorea when immune system attack the basal ganglia but it is transient. Clear? And what is acetosis? Korea, you know it is Michael Jackson dance. What is acetosis? Have you seen Indian dance? Indian classical dance, Kathak dance or have you seen Indian dances or not? Okay, if you really have some time to see Indian dances, uh, they are not haphazard movement like Michael Jackson. They are different. Usually they move their hands in a very artistic way, slow rhythm movements. Right? So these are Indian dances. What is happening? The movements are in the hands or distal part of the limb and they are slow and sinus. No jerk is involved. As if one movement melts into other movement and other movement melts into third movement. Third movement melts into fifth movement. You get it? Very artistic movement. Sometimes patient does not want to dance but these movements are automatically released from basal ganglia. And person is having slow sinus rhythm movements of the hand. Right? These movements are called what? Athetosis. Right? Again, this is a damage in indirect pathway and excessive stimulation. Is that right? All those diseases which can produce chorea, they can also produce athetosis. For example, listen now, it's very easy to understand. If motor programs are haphazardly and rapidly released, that will produce chorea. If motor programs are released very slowly but automatically without any will and one movement convert into other movement smoothly, this is acetosis. So many patients have chorea and acetosis both. We say patient have choreoacetosis. Is that right? So you have Michael Jackson dance here 
and here you have Indian classical dance. Now we come to the dystonias. Dystonias are when the muscles, especially the muscle, axial muscles or truncal muscles, they are over contracting in a very prolonged fashion like this and it remains like this. This is called dystonia and if in some dystonia neck is bent like this and very painful right we call it torticollis have you heard of it so dystonia here what is happening which movements are over released which movements are over released truncal muscles axial muscles is that right again when sudden jerky movements uncontrollable of the limbs what is that purposeless movement yes chorea and distal part of the limbs moving in a slow sinus movement acetosis and if these muscles for very long time like this and then like this what is this dystonias and then there's hemibalismus this is very dramatic have you seen arabic dance yeah you are not really dance people right okay anyway you know michael jackson dance is what chorea Indian classical dances, acetosis. Now, if you see really classical Arabic dance, you have seen what is the, the special feature of that? It's very different from Indian dance. Yes, there are violent hip movement and shoulder. I, I really don't want to show it. But I don't know how to do it. But something is happening very drastic to the woman who is dancing, right? Uh, we call it ballet dance type or something, right? You understand it? You know ballet dance. Yeah, every man knows it. Okay, now, actually, if you really imagine a woman who is Arabic dancer and unfortunately, she has some problem in basal ganglia, she will have very dangerous dance, very provocative, right? Now, what really happens that that kind of dance can be called balismus or if it is half of the body, hemibalismus. Let me tell you how it comes. Actually, there is a damage in the subthalamus. There is damage to subthalamus. This is classically seen in patient with hypertension or the diabetic patient. That when they were sleeping, maybe the artery which was supplying to subthalamus that underwent thrombosis or hemorrhage. And there's a small infarction of subthalamus, very little infarction. But in the morning, patient will find that he's having a very dramatic, it is one of the most dramatic presentation in clinical medicine. You know what will happen? When this is, listen, when this is, what is this? Infarcted, remember, there are two subthalamus or one subthalamus? There are two. Now, if this is, suppose, left subthalamus, these fibers will be controlling the left cerebral hemisphere from their corticospinal fibers come and cross to the right side so damages to the left left subthalamus the clinical features will appear on the contralateral side or or if clinical features are on one side subthalamus is damaged on the contralateral side now the subthalamus specially control the hip girdle and shoulder shoulder girdle is that right now if this is damaged, indirect pathway is gone and there is excessive movement especially about the hip or shoulder girdle. Now you imagine, if person is having a sudden movement of the shoulder, what will happen? This air will go like in a ballistic fashion like this. This arm will go suddenly like this, right? Or hip will suddenly move and leg will be going to I don't know where. Is that right? So usually it happened to one subthalamus so half of the body is having violent jerky movement of the limbs initiated from abnormal movement of shoulder girdle or hip girdle you are understanding if it is unilateral we call it hemibalismus if it is bilateral unfortunately we call it balism am i clear any problem up to this all of these are dyskinesias all of them are produced due to abnormal function in direct pathway indirect pathway indirect pathway again Sudden Michael Jackson dance. What is that? Chorea. Indian dance is what? Acetosis. Chorea is sudden purposeless movement, uncontrollable movement of the arm. Right? These are sinus slow movement. 
डिस्टोनिया एक्सियल मसल अट्रंकल मसल इन हाईटोन हैमिबेलिसमस वन लिम्ब और अदर लिम्ब इज फ्लाइंग इन द एयर राइट ड्यू टू सडन मूवमेंट इन द शोल्डर ऑफ द हिप गर्डल राइट so what is this it's like arabic dance very violent movement of hip or shoulder region right you can understand why shoulder region now last thing which is left is tardive dyskinesia tardive dyskinesia is a disease which occurs in those patient who are taking dopamine receptor blocker normally we give dopamine receptor blocker to those patient who have psychosis you know what is psychosis schizophrenia type thing psychosis is the um, severe mental disorder in which you have lost the contact with reality is that right so in psychotic patient one of the way to treat them is giving a uh, dopamine receptor blocker now what happen attention please if you are giving a patient dopamine receptor blocker for very long time if you are blocking these receptor for a long time what will happen to receptor they will down regulate or up regulate they will up regulate if you are blocking the receptors then cell will produce more receptors if you are over stimulating the receptor then cell will produce less receptors wow this is a very basic concept look this is a cell this is a nucleus this is the gene which produces a specific receptor right now if this receptors are totally blocked no action of the receptor is produced genes assume as if there are no receptors so they will produce more receptors you are understanding so what happens this up regulation of receptor so what happens those patient who are given anti psychotic drugs which specially block the dopamine receptors right sometimes prolonged use of such drugs will lead to up regulation of dopamine receptors in striatum we say the tissue become hypersensitive to dopamine and this regulation will become disturbed now you see if there are too much receptors of dopamine here on indirect pathway then it will be excessively inhibited will it be inhibited or not excessively dopamine through d2 receptors inhibit the indirect pathway you are understanding so it is just like damaging the indirect pathway and again what will happen dyskinesia will be produced usually this type of problem occur in older people usually in females who are 50 60 70 year old and they have been given anti psychotic drug for a long time and they develop a very strange type of choreoacetotic movement or abnormal movement you know what are these these are usually in their lips and tongue and in this area probably the basal ganglia which control this area there there is a lot of abnormality and these unfortunate old females previously they had a trouble they were psychotic and now they develop a new trouble after using the drug for a long time they they have abnormal movement of jaw lips tongue and all the time what they are doing they are like a fly catching movement of the tongue or smacking the lips and they cannot control it they cannot control it right? i am not going to do it again right so what happens that this type of movements which develop abnormal orofacial movement uncontrollable movement lips smacking their own lips lips smacking are tongue flying movement and uh, tongue not flying fly catching movement as you have seen frog catch them or something right all these movements uncontrolled coming this is called tardive dyskinesia is that right so we have finished the lecture but before finishing it i will make a rapid review just in 5 minutes first of all clinically basal ganglia include yes caudate nucleus then putamen globus pallidus putamen and, and associated nuclei are subthalamic and substantia nigra now caudate with putamen are called neostriatum and putamen with globus pallidus is called lentiform nucleus and all of them are called corpus striatum is that right number 1 number 2 direct pathway yes you now you will tell me from cortex what is coming down glutaminergic fiber from striatum going to the pallidum gabergic fiber from pallidum to thalamus which fibers gabergic fiber from there back to the cortex what are this 
glutaminergic. So what happened? Glutaminergic, gabergic, gabergic, glutaminergic. That's it. Direct pathway. Indirect pathway. What happens? Glutaminergic fiber to striatum. To the external globus pliedus, which fiber? Gabergic from there to subthalamus. Gabergic from subthalamus to pliedum, internum. Glutaminergic from there to thalamus. Gabergic and from there to final up. Yes? Glutaminergic. Now, direct pathway lien will produce hypokinesia or dyskinesias. Hypokinesias. Indirect pathways lien will produce hyperkinesia or dyskinesias. Is that right? Classical example of hypokinesia producing problem is Parkinson's disease. Where is the lien? Nigrostriatal pathway. Substantia nigra, right? Where there is deficiency of dopamine. Dopamine, nigrostriatal pathway, dopamine stimulate the direct pathway and inhibit the indirect pathway. Acetylcholine inhibit the direct pathway and stimulates the indirect pathway. Is that right? Now, if direct path, now what are the common thing in direct pathway? Direct pathway is short pathway. Direct pathway does not involve subthalamus. Direct pathway is glutaminergic. Gabergic, gabergic, glutaminergic. Direct pathway is excitatory pathway. Lions of direct pathway produce hypokinesias and dopamine stimulate direct pathway. Clear? Indirect pathway. Indirect pathway is glutaminergic, gabergic, again gabergic to subthalamus, glutaminergic back to pliedum, gabergic to thalamus and then glutaminergic back to cortex. This is indirect pathway. Indirect pathway is longer pathway. Indirect pathway involves the subthalamus. Right? <coughs> Sorry. Direct pathway stimulate the movement. Indirect pathway inhibit the movement. Is that right? And indirect pathway lions produce hyperkinetic movement or dyskinetic movement. Classical examples are choreas like a chorea which can like which dance? Michael Jackson dances chorea. It occurs in which conditions? Huntington's disease, St. Vitus, which is in rheumatic fever, and Wilson's disease, in copper overloading disease, right? Then we come to acetosis. It is like slow Indian dance. That can occur also in the same diseases which can produce chorea. Then we have come to dystonias. This is hypertone in the axial muscles or truncal muscles. Then we come to bellismus. Where is the lien? Hemibellismus, contralateral subthalamus. This is like Arabic dance, violent hip or girdle movement with flying limbs. Is that right? And then tardive dyskinesia. These are abnormal orofacial movement. Choreoacetotic orofacial movement produced in patient due to chronic use of such antipsychotic which are dopamine receptor blocker. Where dopamine receptors become overexpressed. Any question here? There's no question. Class dismiss. Thank you.